he said his life was under threat. But his appeals were lost within the four walls of the jail in Pakistan. His family reached out to the Indian government several times. But those in power here looked the other way. Days later, he was killed in a jail in Pakistan, a victim of a premeditated attack. Pakistan butchered as India continued to appease. Sarabjit Singh lost his life due to India's soft diplomacy. Hello and welcome to this episode of Latitude. I'm Maruf Raza and the top story this week is the death of Sarabjit Singh, an Indian prisoner in Pakistan, and how official negligence led to Sarabjit Singh being attacked and his loss of his life. Sarabjit Singh was attacked with bricks and rods by at least six people in a high security prison. His death was a cold blooded murder carried out by his inmates, but clearly planned by those in power in Pakistan. Sarabjit Singh spent more than two decades in the jail here in Lahore, but in the past few months, he wrote several letters to his family, informing them of death threat to his life. He even informed the authorities in Pakistan, but neither the Pakistan government nor the government of India responded. And after remaining in coma for six days, he succumbed to his injuries. India lent its neighbor a long rope only to see an arrogant Pakistan dismiss a carefully thought of attack on an Indian prisoner as a scuffle. But far from displaying outrage, the Indian reaction, as always, was diplomatic. Our Prime Minister even told the nation that our government had repeatedly pleaded with the Pakistani government, but they had overlooked our request on Sarabjit. Instead of making Pakistan apologize, a government was pleading with its neighbor, which speaks volumes about India's soft foreign policy. There's lack of proper thinking as to how to handle Pakistan, quote unquote. From Pakistan's side, uh, they have got Islam on one side. On the other, an anti-India feeling has to be whipped up periodically to keep them together. In India, we have, uh, unfortunately, vote bank politics, which does not allow us to take a correct, strategically correct action with Pakistan when required. It is not the first time an Indian prisoner was killed in a Pakistani prison. A few months ago, Chamil Singh was tortured to death in a Lahore jail. But till date, India has not managed to make Pakistan share his post-mortem details. Two Indian soldiers were beheaded on the line of control earlier this year. But within days, India indulged in lunch diplomacy with the Pakistan Prime Minister. I think we have to recognize that in Pakistan, uh, policy towards India in particular is driven not by the normal kind of democratic establishment that we are used to in India, but by the army and that the Pakistan army has a vested interest in uh, a position of hostility towards India. I think India needs to demonstrate clarity. Uh, no mixed signals, consistency, consistency in pushing the core and vital issues, starting with terrorism. Pakistan continues to give 2611 mastermind Hafiz Saeed a free hand. But we still give their judicial commission probing the terror attacks a warm reception in India. And add to that the recent developments as far as diplomacy is concerned. The red carpet welcome when Zardari visited India and Raja Parvez Ashraf when he visited the Ajmer Dargah Sharif. But Pakistan has been doing a lot. But we don't grow up at the bureaucratic level at the foreign office level, 
at the immigration people level, at all these levels. They can only, this, this can only, otherwise what happens that we have dinners, we have parties and then the matter, matter ends and then we start from zero again. The soft diplomacy with Pakistan has failed at almost every level. But the question is, for how long and why should India continue with its accommodating approach when Pakistan almost never bothers to reciprocate? Clearly, there is much criticism of India's soft diplomacy with Pakistan, particularly in the aftermath of the 2611 attacks in Mumbai and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's initiative to improve ties with Pakistan. We have with us on this show now, Mr. Gaur Ayub Khan, former Foreign Minister of Pakistan. Mr. Khan, sir, is this criticism true? No, I don't think so. In Pakistan, there's quite a change in attitude. People are wanting friendship with India because we have so many concerns on our western border. In Afghanistan itself, with America and NATO withdrawing in 2014, what scenario will develop? Hopefully, it should not be like what happened with Najibullah Khan when the Soviets withdrew. So, uh, I personally think there's tremendous amount of goodwill for India, and India should now tap this goodwill that is emerging in Pakistan. Well, sir, Afghanistan in 2014 is the big picture, but on ground, all political parties have been calling for good relations with India during the elections. But none came forward to take this opportunity to push Sarabjit's case to come back to India and win over India's goodwill. Why? Had uh, there been a government, uh, this is a caretaker government, they have to tread very, very cautiously. And uh, I myself, had I been the foreign minister sitting there, I would have recommended very strongly that under these circumstances, if there's a request from the government of India to have sent him uh, for medical treatment uh, to India. I think the jail authorities uh, were not careful enough to have kept him in a death cell. Usually they keep three uh, death cell inmates in one prison. Knowing that he is uh, non-Muslim, the other two would be having a bias. I have been in a death cell and I know the conditions and I've had 14 hangings next to my cell in Peshawar jail. I think uh, he would have had a difficult time and uh, this prolonged period must have been telling on him. But it's very unfortunate that he was brutalized and the jail authorities should be held responsible for it, for having put him in such a situation. Now that Sarabjit has lost his life, would it be fair to say that public anger in India, which is being picked up by political parties, could derail all the diplomatic efforts that have gone in in the past between the two nations? Or could Sarabjit work as a catalyst for both countries to really relook at their relations and improve ties? Had the government of India at a very personal top level made a request at the very top level with the, uh, with the personalities in Pakistan, I think uh, earlier repatriation of Sarabjit Singh could have been possible. But uh, when you say a wake-up call, true in Indian jails or in Pakistani jails, there are more uh, prisoners of Pakistanis in Indian jails than in, in Pakistan. Now, this should not allow to sour our relations. It has been a tragic uh, situation. Government has nothing to do with it. Now, supposing if the government wanted to do something like this, as it has been suggested in India by various personalities, then the day he was arrested and detected as a raw agent, he could have been uh, sort of eliminated and India would have known, but most in Pakistan would not have known. That had, did not happen. But let's not allow it to sour our relations. We should move forward. You've talked about moving forward, sir. What, in your view, would be the short-term steps and the long-term efforts that both countries need to put into place to improve bilateral ties? It is not necessary that every time the Prime Minister of each country or the President of Pakistan visits India. It's not necessary every time the Foreign Minister or the External Affairs Minister of India comes to Pakistan. Let there be other ministries coming in for trade, for communications, for production, for various scientific things. On those scales we should and then allow the people of Pakistan and people of India to, to come and ease of, uh, easy visa facilities. I was in uh, New Delhi about five, six years ago on a uh, talk show in one of the medias, Indian media. And after it finished, all the crowd that had been gathered there, they jumped up and he said, Khan Saab, 
please make facilities for us to come to Pakistan. We want to see Pakistan. I found them very, very friendly, and I am very supportive of the fact that let's open up our countries. Now, to say that somebody from India is going to be a spy all the time in Pakistan, those days are over. Clearly, both India and Pakistan need to revisit their relationship and redefine the steps they need to take to win the trust between the two countries that is far from established. We thank Mr. Gaurav Yub Khan for being with us. Welcome back. We now look at the Chinese incursions in Ladakh and the foreign policy challenges it has thrown up and what could and should be India's responses. While Pakistan is defying India at every stage, our northeastern neighbour is inching closer to India at a very steady pace. With Chinese troops squatting on 750 square kilometres of our land in northern Ladakh, an area roughly half the size of New Delhi. China seems to be creeping into our territory, keeping the escalation level under control. China doesn't want to recognize that JNK is part of India. And that is why, while we say that the boundary is 4,000 kilometers, they talk about the boundary between India and China to be only 2,000 kilometers. A couple of weeks ago, China sent two Chinese patrols on foot. Two more arrived in military vehicles, while a Chinese helicopter flew overhead. And before we knew it, around 30 Chinese soldiers had pitched three tents on our side of the LAC overnight. But two weeks after that, and three flag meets down, the number of Chinese tents pitched on Indian soil has increased to five. Add to that constant flow of reinforcements via a motorable road. The Chinese clearly don't intend to move. People like myself have been saying that they're here to stay. The, uh, even the military le leadership are talking about this as a local incident, as a tactical incident. This is a tactical incident with strategic implications. India on the verge of losing control over a strategically crucial area of 750 square kilometers in Ladakh. But for our external affairs minister, the Chinese incursion is just an acne. China in recent times has become proactive, aggressive, assertive, and India's soft diplomacy is only encouraging them further. Numerous rounds of border talks, but no exchange of maps in the real areas of trouble. China builds dams on the Brahmaputra, and all India does is raise concerns. What follows is newer dams. The question is, why this wimpish attitude in dealing with China? We deal very softly, softly with China. We are afraid to annoy China. The, oh, we have $80 billion worth of trade, and that $80 billion worth of trade must go up to $100 billion of trade, regardless of what it does to your national interest or to your strategic vital ground in Ladakh. China has pushed India to the wall. The message to India is that it won't tolerate India upgrading its military capability and increased Indian presence at the border. China's foreign policy goes back to looking strong as a nation domestically as well, something India lacks far behind in. China doesn't want, doesn't, cannot afford uh, to be perceived that its um, uh, claimed territories, well, of course, uh, as I was saying, the line of control is not defined. So in the eyes of the Chinese people, then China cannot afford to um, give ground um, to uh, in, uh, any perceived infringement on China's perceived territory. Because uh, look at China, you know, China was invaded by Japan, by all the powers uh, you know, over the past 100 years. So this is the one part of China's psyche. India has been bruised and battered on all fronts internationally because of lack of a clear direction in its foreign policy. 
openly dropped by Pakistan and now snubbed by China too. The question is, can India afford to be complacent anymore? Clearly, China has thrown up another set of diplomatic challenges for India. And we have with us Mr. Jaswant Singh, former Foreign Minister of India, to address these issues. Sir, it is said that China's attention is divided on many fronts. And Chinese and Indian troops are equally matched on the Sino-Indian border. So do we overrate the Chinese threat? It's not so much a question of numerical equality of troops on the border. It's the leadership, the governance, and the approach that you have about this question. Um, China's new president, within days of uh, being installed in office, has clearly said that we shall not be compromising on our territorial integrity. Now, whether it be South China Sea or with Japan, and we should take it that that is the approach as far as Sino-Indian border is concerned. Secondly, we should also not be deluded into in our considerations as if uh, because of the trade figures between China and India, therefore the pain or the difficulties on the border are in any fashion going to be ameliorated. They are not. Let us be realistic about it. Where, in your view, has New Delhi faltered in dealing with the current Chinese incursions, both militarily and diplomatically? No, first, I am not, uh, I'm not an advocate. I'm not a fire eater. I'm not advocating a, a military repost to the Dalat Bay Godly situation. But diplomatically, certainly, a much firmer message could have gone to Beijing at the very beginning. There were simultaneous uh, some steps, military in nature, which could have got taken. But there is a confused setup around uh, Dalat Bay Goldi. Is it the army that is in position there? Is it the ITBP? Is it the Indutriple Border Police? Is Border Police under the Home Ministry? So with this divided uh, command and control situation, you cannot have a single voice response. Uh, my good friend, uh, the Defence Minister, Anthony, says one thing. The Minister of External Affairs says placatory things. Prime Minister says altogether a different thing. So with these various voices emanating from the, uh, from the high ministers of the government of India, what else is China to do but treat it all with disdain? With Sarabjit Singh's death, there is considerable public outcry that India must revisit its relationship with Pakistan. In your view, what should now be India's short-term and long-term objectives in dealing with Pakistan? We have to recognize that relations between India and Pakistan are given to frequent fracture. And the nature of the two countries and the nature of the origins of Pakistan being what they are, every incident can get blown out of proportion. At the present moment, I do not know who is governing Pakistan. Whose voice is it in Pakistan that carries the weight? Is it uh, the Taliban who are dictating? Is it the ISI? Is it the army? Is it the uh, interim government that is in charge? Please recognize that in Pakistan, it's a state of great uncertainty too, uh, that elections are to come. What do you revisit when the existing policy of the government of India is itself so wishy-washy that you do not know where the government will stand on any particular issue? Given that India and Pakistan's relations are 
are prone to frequent fractures. That is the issue that must be addressed. Well, thank you very much, sir. It's quite clear that for an India keen to play a global role, the biggest challenge is to address the issues in its neighborhood. We'll be back next week with another episode of Latitude, and we hope you'll join us then. Goodbye and thank you.